-hmm. All right. Today we're excited to have uh, uh, Mario Stamp from uh, Argo National Laboratory to uh, uh, come to Notre Dame and to CIS, CICS to speak about computational material science, humans, uh, and machines. That's a very bold title. <laughs> I, I need to start learning about humans and machines, okay? And uh, so Marius is uh, a present interim director of the Systems uh, Science Center at uh, Argonne. He is an affiliated uh, fellow at the University of Chicago's uh, Computational Institute and also at the Northwestern Argonne Institute for Science and Engineering. His interests are spanning uh, all areas of materials physics uh, and in particular the computational parts that interface with data science and machine learning. And that's a topic that uh, Maurice will talk uh, uh, to us today. We're very pleased to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zabaras, for the invitation. It's my first time at uh, Notre Dame University. I'm glad to be here. You guys arranged for a reasonable weather. Uh, <laughs> compared to Chicago, where we live, uh, this is really, really spring. Um, uh, I'm glad to be here. I appreciate you coming. Uh, I understand that uh, the exam sessions start next week, so you all must be uh, uh, preparing for that. I hope some elements of the talk will help you pass uh, uh, some of the tests, if, yes. Okay, <clears throat> so why this title? Um, I thought that uh, some elements of computational material science would be of interest to you, and uh, the connection to mathematics, statistics, artificial intelligence, machine learning too. I structured the presentation to illustrate this apparently weird partnership between humans and machines and how that de has developed over time. I'm going to propose to you that humans have been interested in materials, uh, in the physics, chemistry, uh, in making good materials for a variety of applications since thousands of years ago. The interest in computation, in calculating something started, in, in my opinion, with uh, production of alcohol. I think the first phase diagram, equilibrium phase diagram, that was ever uh, uh, drawn on a piece of paper was uh, for the purpose of determining what is the exact ratio of water and alcohol that one to, needs to achieve in double distillation. So as you look at the diagram, it appears that whoever drew the lines also sampled from the experimental part of this project because they are kind of shaky. You see uh, uh, temperature uh, versus composition here. And that uh, really helps uh, the experimental part uh, increasing the alcohol content of the, uh, of the drink. Now, equilibrium phase diagrams that show how stable different phases are in a multi-component material, in a multi-component systems, can be drawn by humans with, in a very simple way, I would say. So many of you had diagrams like this in your uh, thermodynamics classes, perhaps, when studying uh, phase transformations, equilibrium. And maybe even ternary diagrams. And those are harder to visualize. You need a 3D representation on a two-dimensional piece of paper. <coughs> Going to four component systems or more, it's even diffi more difficult, sometimes impossible, to, to visualize. So we, uh, we needed uh, a method of calculating these diagrams. It's not simply drawing them. And we own a huge step forward in that direction to Willard Gibbs, an American scientist, a man who lived in heaven. He was born in New Heaven, Connecticut. He spent most of his life in New Heaven, <coughs> Connecticut, and died in New Heaven, Connecticut. What more can you ask for, right? He had this extraordinary idea that it is not truly the phase that has the minimum free energy that's going to be stable, but it's actually the equality of the chemical potentials that two components, A and B, have in 
two different phases. So if the chemical potential of component A in phase alpha is the same as in phase beta, and that goes for component B, then we can reach equilibrium. And with that, we have now a method of calculating equilibrium phase diagrams for multi-component systems. So humans and machines started to partner at the point where computers were able to help us calculate numbers and even create graphics, figures. And I'm going to give you a few examples of computational methods that we are using at Argonne National Laboratory in partnership with University of Chicago and Northwestern universities. These methods operate at different length scales and time scales. For example, here you have a length scale characteristic length scale for a specific phenomenon, and this would be the time scale. How to use this diagram, which is quite popular, and I know it's quite popular because many people uh, use it without even referencing it. So uh, it, it starts with the physics of the problem you are inter interested in. If the phenomenon you care about is, uh, uh, has a characteristic length around one micron, for example, or several microns and a few nanoseconds, then you better try and use molecular dynamics, which is a classical uh, approach to interactions between atoms. If what you care about happens at a lower time and length scale, then maybe quantum mechanics, density functional theory can capture that. If we are talking about heat or chemical transport in a real part, a real component, human size if you want, then we may go to finite element and so on. These methods can be used in isolation or can be coupled. You can have finite element simulations of heat transport and get informed by phase field at mesoscale for example, to capture the evolution of microstructure. Think of solidification, nucleation, and growth, and things like that. So this diagram is useful in terms of helping you decide what computational method you could use in addition and in partnership with experiment to design to create a new material. Let me give you an example. Molecular dynamics employed to understand and predict melting melting of gallium. So we set up a simulation domain that has liquid gallium. All atoms are gallium. Don't ask me why they are pink. I think pink looks good on black. No other reason. A disordered phase to the left, the liquid. A little bit of disordered phase to the right because we want to ensure periodical boundary conditions. And the solid in this region. And I'm going to run a simulation that is representative of what happens in the real phenomenon, in the real melting. The temperature is a bit above the melting temperature. And the question I would like to ask is how this melting proceeds? Does it happen everywhere in the volume? Does it happen from the interface towards the mill? As you can see, this order propagates from the liquid, liquid phase into the solid. The solid kind of fights for its life, tries to stay ordered, but it cannot. So why is computational material science useful at all? Several reasons. One is to understand how things happen when we cannot probe necessarily experiment. We can observe melting, solidification at a large scale, but we cannot really look at atoms and see how exactly that process occurs. So it helps us understand. It also helps us predict. How about I alloy a gallium with some other metal? How would that impact the melting temperature interval? How is that going to happen? Faster, slower? There are a number of uh, scenarios that I can examine using computation, and then I can validate through experiments. So computational was, computation was never intended to eliminate or displace experiments from science. It augments, it helps experimental work through providing better understanding in some cases to exploring some areas where experiment is very difficult. <coughs> but it cannot survive without partnership with experimental work. Furthermore, going back to how to calculate a phase diagram, thanks to Gibbs, we can now explore chemical potentials, solve system of partial differential equations, get the 
equilibrium uh, constraints and, and find a solution for those. Here we have a representation of free energies of various phases versus composition. And here there is temperature, and you will see how this simple computational tool can show us how the relative position of various free energies changes with temperature. You see, green used to be stable everywhere, the green phase. Now this other phase comes in, in, a, in the lower concentration interval. So we have tools, computers help us now create improved phase diagrams, phase equilibrium diagrams, even for systems for which we have no information. Think about something uh, uh, that is, uh, let's say, out of the ordinary. What? I choose technetium and americium. Most likely nobody studied technetium and americium and dysprosium if you want to put something else with a um at the end. We don't have anything about that. So computation can give us some information about thermodynamic properties, can help us estimate what the equilibrium is going to be. But to bring the discussion to a topic that I think is common for many people in the room, at least those with whom I had discussions this morning, and uh, Professor Savas, to uncertainty evaluation. How beautiful those diagrams are with the thin line that seem to be perfect representations where exactly phases change and are in But is that true? We know it's not true. We know there is uncertainty in that. Can we calculate that uncertainty? It turns out that it is possible to evaluate uncertainty in phase diagrams. Even the simple one, this is a liquidus solidus diagram, uranium, plutonium. We did this circle, I think this was, what, 15 years ago. One of the first papers published about how to calculate uncertainty in phase equilibrium, it used Bayesian analysis and a genetic algorithm at the time to get these intervals. So we look at over 20 data sets coming from a variety of research groups and ask the question, what would be a reasonable uh, interval of certainty for the liquidus and for the solidus? And it, it is sizable, it's 100 plus minus 100 degrees. How about when a diagram is uh, uh, even more complex, has more phases. For example, here we have hafnium oxygen, a system we are interested in because of its applications in electronics, memory devices, computer uh, processing units. It is even difficult to represent uncertainty intervals in such uh, a complex diagram. I chose just to show you this liquidus part with the eutectic point and a little bit about the allotropic phase transformations. But should I plot all the data and all the uh, uncertainty intervals, it would be impossible even to understand what the diagram shows. So an important question is, as you calculate uncertainty, quantify uncertainty, how you represent it, how you use it, and maybe even more importantly, can you manage it, can you reduce it, can computation help you reduce it? The results may be unexpected, I'm just going to point out one of them. You think that as temperature goes higher, uncertainty increases. No, it's kind of logical. The higher the temperature, uh, atoms vibrate uh, more, uh, there, are d there is damage to that material. There should be, we, we should have higher error bars, higher uncertainty. That is not true in this case. You see, plus minus, I don't know, uh, 50 degrees here, plus minus 75 degrees here, very small uncertainty at the melting, congruent in melting point. Why do you think that is? It is because although temperature indeed enhances processes that can increase uncertainty, people have studied this melting point far more than they have studied the other transformations. So we have more information, some of it of high quality, that can help us evaluate, give us confidence in, that, uh, in a certain model. So the more we know about uh, a property or a process parameter, the better our confidence in that model is. And that competes with the fact that, of course, damage increases with temperature. This is very important, and this idea that the quality of the data and the quality of the model is something we should take into account, not 
all data sets are created equal. Not all models are created equal. We own uh, uh, an interesting approach, Bayesian analysis, to uh, an unlikely contributor. And that is Reverend Bayes. And he lived long time ago, 300 years, more than 300 years ago. And he was in an embassy in England. And for some reason, which I'm not going to discuss, they played a lot of games. And Reverend Bayes wanted to win at these games. And he had an idea that the more you play, an observation, the more you play, the better you are at a game. Practic practicing makes you better. What's important is that he found a mathematical representation of this concept. He proposed that if we look at a number of models, take, uh, I don't know, liquidus lines in a phase diagram, or free energy models, and let's say we get three ones, three models, one from Notre Dame University, one from Argonne National Lab, one from, I don't know, MIT. Should we assign prior probabilities for these models to represent reality, to represent the data correctly, based on expert op opinion? Now let me just assign some probabilities. 90% to be correct for the model at Notre Dame, 80% uh, to be correct the one at Argonne, and 60% the one at MIT. If we are able to evaluate likelihoods of the data to be correctly represented by the model, which are, in fact, conditional probabilities, uh, we can calculate posterior probabilities of the models to represent the data. And these probabilities, as we accumulate information, may be different from the initial one. The Notre Dame could be 95%. Argonne could drop all the way to 40%, and MIT go up to a different value. So you see, this is a simple idea. In fact, the more data you get, the more you analyze it, your representation of reality, of material properties in particular, improves. And the quality of that information is critical in reducing the uncertainty and increasing the confidence. Now, he didn't have a chance to publish that during his lifetime. In fact, he sent a letter to a mathematician, Cantor, Dave Cantor, uh, Dave Price, sorry, who to his credit, years after Bayes died, published in 1763 that letter and said, this is not my work. I got this in a letter from a friend. He's dead now. But anyways, I'm telling you, he is the one who created this math. How precious that is, right? So you can find that. I have a PDF copy. You can find it free on Google. It is an amazing achievement from a man who was not even a mathematician. Now. What is a practical application? And how do we evaluate model quality? Here's an example. We take specific heat information for half new metal in this case versus temperature, a number of data sets. These are the data sets represented in, in the coordinates. And here are the, the references. As you can tell, some of them are at low temperature, some at high temperature. There is some spread in the information. There is one that is really going in a weird way, uh, almost vertical at a low temperature. And we do what I just explained. We assign prior probabilities for each of them to be true, do the Bayesian analysis, and calculate the confidence interval, 95% confidence, using the Bayesian approach and the uh, MCMC met metropolis testing algorithms. Pretty large uncertainty, very little confidence that this forms, this model in particular, the polynomial expression, represents the data well. Unfortunately, all thermodynamic databases use this model for representing all a version of it, specific heat. You can tell just looking at it that is not a good representation. Should we add some physics to it? For example, for the low temperature, a Debye model of the specific heat and, and still preserve some polynomial terms and do the same analysis with the same information. We get much higher confidence, much smaller uncertainty through the Bayesian process. And we are able now to say that, OK, so this is a good representation of the data we have with the exception of this outline. What should we do with the outline? It's very tempting, tempting to exclude it to say, no, this is, must be wrong. This is garbage. Let's use the rest. And that would be a dangerous thing to do. 
all outliers desire, uh, uh, deserve a careful examination. There might be some physics there that we should not ignore just because it doesn't, the data doesn't look like everything else. So you see already, you may say, of course, this was easy enough even without Bayesian analysis because you look at the data and say this cannot be right and this is way better. But now think about a situation where you have a thousand compounds, components in a system. You have a, um, a million phases. You have data that you cannot even plot. It will fill this entire uh, screen. Humans alone, just looking at the information, may not be able to decide what model is the best. We need the help of the machine. We need a machine to examine the information, large data sets, some coming at you at a high speed, right? Data flows. We need a machine to help us understand how, how this happens. And it used to be that only astrophysics had this problem. Too much data from their observatories, they couldn't analyze it in time. Material science is beginning to be one of the research areas where plenty of data is the case. Uh, we're working with NIST, National Institute of Science and Technology, and they have information about 24,000 pure systems with over a million phases, data points. And if you go to binaries, another 52,000, and if you do ternaries, then another, and it goes easily to million, billions of data points. Are we going to be able to analyze this simply by, no matter how many postdocs and students you have, you cannot possibly look at a billion phases and analyze all their properties. It is still humans who decide how the research needs to be conducted. I'm saying that computers are now a partner, a team member, that can help considerably and do the analysis in a, in a quite sophisticated way. We look at thermodynamic consistency, for example, uh, look, uh, uh, try to make predictions, participate in design of new materials. And there are co private companies who do the same thing. I don't know if you're familiar with Citroen Informatics. Informatics, they use machine learning to analyze data. You can put your data, upload it on Citroen, and they will do this analysis for you almost for free. Why I'm saying almost for free? If you are from a university or even from a national lab, they will really do it for free. If you are from a private company that wants to develop a product for profit, then they will charge you for doing that analysis. They have three modes of operating, I believe. There is a materials data facility that we are building in the Chicago area, and I'm hoping that some of you will be interested in joining, that will do a similar analysis, but will also use metadata. So we'll extract information from journal articles, reports, databases, not only numbers on, in tables or figures, but also the text that explains how that information was obtained. Where does that help? In your priors. So when you, you put in the initial probability of something to be good, it may be based on the quality of that research group, the quality of their uh, characterization methods, uh, the quality of their work, scientific work or engineering work, and that will help the analysis. So this was humans and machines working together, if you want, and I do think that machines, in fact, make us smarter, improve our memory, improve our vision in, to some degree. They kind of augment our brain. They do not replace us. They make our brain even more powerful. We can analyze more data at a faster pace if we partner with a machine. And this is a recent development. I think it goes along with the evolution of the role of computation in science and engineering. Those of you who uh, were alive in 1950, I uh, have to say I wasn't, but I, w I, I learned a lot from uh, uh, movies like The Imitation Game, everybody saw that, Alan Turing, and know that computers were created, in fact, this is a, an actual picture from NPL, from one of the first computers, to crunch numbers, to get you a number, faster than a human calculator could do. It was extremely valuable, it helped in many ways, you should watch the movie or learn more about the work at the time. But that changed in the 70s, and I was a few years old at that time, 
by the introduction of the personal computer and the fact that it would help you edit a document, plot a figure, uh, help we do some, uh, uh, do more than calculate numbers. It, was, it didn't came cheap, uh, $6,000 for a machine that is called intelligent just because the keyboard had a print button. So you didn't have to type print, you, pr you push print and it would print in. That was something at a time. In the 90s, 1997s, computer simulations came in. A variety of simulations. This is the melting of gallium that I showed, but you can imagine others. Finite element simulations, deformation of bridges, impact. All kind of explorations of a scientific engineering space using computers. Computers suddenly were part of the research process and the engineering design process. And I think we are now in this stage where computers can provide intelligent assistance. They do more, even more than what we were able to do before. They can advise us. They have access to knowledge. This is a picture of IBM Watson, who is not, I believe, an intelligent machine. I think IBM Watson is the most knowledgeable machine you can have. It knows everything. It wins jeopardy contests, it beat humans in jeopardy, it has access to data, can reason to some degree, but not a complete degree, in my opinion. There, there is progress with that. At some point, it may become one of the first intelligent machines. Artificial intelligence has a rich history. If, if you followed, it had ups and, ups and downs. It started uh, around the 50s with the Turing test. You're familiar with the Turing test? Yeah, so you put some, uh, <coughs> you put uh, a number of judges in a room, and then in a separate room, you have a computer and a human. And the judges uh, engage in conversation via email or text or whatever you want with these two entities. One of them a computer and the other one a human. At the end, following some conversations, each judge decides if the partner was a machine or a human. If the machine can fool enough judges into believing that it is a human, it passed the test. And the test was passed in 2014 by Eugene. Eugene is a fictional character, a 13 years old Ukrainian boy who doesn't exist, created by a few scientists, some Russian, some uh, Ukrainian, some Belarus. If you look that up and find the, the conversation uh, this fictitious 13 years old uh, uh, guy had with the judges, it is unbelievable. It uses slang, you can take, it's the coolest 13 years old that you can believe, answers uh, questions in a witty way, very smart. I'm not surprised it passed the test. Does it mean that it's an intelligent software? Maybe not. Conversation, communication is only part of intelligence, I would say. Many developments from 2011, I would say, to 2017. But artificial intelligence had a winter, 1966 to 97. This is 30 years where almost nothing happened. It, it got a bad reputation at the time, mostly, in my opinion, for overstating what was capable of doing, which happens with many research fields. If you promise too much and say, oh, we're going to do this and that and don't deliver, the buzzword becomes uh, untrustworthy, right? So that happened at the time. There was another reason, I would say, for this re-emerging uh, of artificial intelligence, which has to do with the fact that we have now internet. We can communicate, exchange information, far easier and better than, than during that period of time. There are other developments that we can talk about, the personal assistance, Siri, for example, and uh, Alexa, some of you have Alexa, some of you have uh, Google, hey Google, or, and they can provide information, uh, personal assistance, GPS, something that personal assistant will dumb us down. The GPS did, definitely did that in my case. I can barely drive around without looking into the GPS thing. And I used to be like a pigeon. Where is north? Where is east? Uh, I figure out uh, the best optimal path. Now I rely so much on the GPS. That. So that is perhaps one of the dangers. We do conduct research in artificial intelligence at Argonne, and I'll, happy, I'll be happy to collaborate with some of you. 
And here's, here are some examples. So as I said, I believe that computers augment our brain, improve the abilities of our brain. Do we are not, I am not engaged in pro projects that kind to try to morph the anatomy and functionality of the brain to create electronic devices that look like synapses and neurons. And there is a fruitful area of research uh, in that direction. We are more interested in creating software that can improve our memory and help us learning. So we do work in machine learning, deep learning, and predictive analytics. We are interested in natural language processing, have software that can analyze 10,000 pages documents and give you a summary of half page with a meaningful summary in minutes. A human can never do that. We can read an article, which is, I don't know, 10, 20 pages, it will take an hour. We can make a meaningful summary of that, an abstract. A machine can do that as a first screening pass in, and can help us examine very large documents and at least point to the human which ones are interesting and which one we should examine better. We do work on uh, expert systems, decision making, uh, reasoning, robotics. Not that advanced, but we have robotics, uh, robotic arms that can control, for example, remotely dangerous materials, nuclear materials, chemical explosives, and so forth. And we do a lot of work on vision, especially image recognition and immersive visualization. And I'm going to give you some examples uh, as I approach the, the, the end of my talk. So here are the two examples. We have a visualization lab, I invite you to, to see it, where we use 3D goggles to look into properties of complex physical and social systems. It's kind of the PlayStation games you like to play. In fact, all scientists and like to play, right? So, but it's a more serious game. For example, if you want to train somebody um, to explore a certain area in the wild, remote location, you don't necessarily send them there directly. Maybe there is a way to analyze uh, the environment using these 3D goggles. Same things, you can go into a museum and see what's in there. You can examine the streets of, I don't know, Damascus or Cairo or Beijing or Paris using this technology. You can also look in the interconnections between elements of a complex systems. For example, defects in atoms. In that solidification process, you can dive in and see exactly where vacancy forms, where interstitials are, and so forth. We also work on augmented reality, which is very different. It's kind of like having these glasses that I'm wearing and uh, display, having them display contextual information. If I look at uh, a building, like in this picture, it will tell me the architect, the style, the year. Uh, if I look at you in, the, in this room, it will tell me your names, your date of birth, how likely you are to pass the exam next year, week, and, and things like that. So it provides contextual information as you look at something, which is also very important. But, uh, just a few more examples of how artificial intelligence can impact uh, our work and our world in general, not only professionally. Uh, there is a software that can now contribute to cars, that uh, self-driving cars, with all the technical and the ethical issues that that brings. What would the software decide? Should it have the choice to make a choice between running over a child on the street or running over a group of pedestrians on the sidewalk? How would it decide? How will we human decide? Is there any component of ethics, of morals, that we can put into software like this? Or well, winning strategy games, for example. At Argon, we have a team that works on that. Again, it's not about computer games. It's about understanding how to win in the energy market, how to win in the financial market. Or who knows, how to weave into an actual conflict. Should there be one? I hope there, there is none, but should there be one? And even surprisingly, he, there is a creative side of artificial intelligence. In 2016 in Japan, they had a contest for short stories. And a short story completely written by an AI code passed the first screening process. Didn't win, didn't even make it to the second or the third. But I think it's 
impressive already that a number of, of judges said, oh, this, it's a reasonable story. They didn't question if it was written by a human by a machine. It made it to the second round, and it was eliminated for some reason. But I thought that was really impressive. There is software that can take a full movie, a two-hour movie, and create a trailer for you. It understands what is action, what is uh, the climax, uh, how the ending, where the ending is, what is the most interesting way of associating images with dialogue, and can create a trailer that is of reasonable quality. But now, not everybody believes is as enthusiastic about AI as I am. Some people think, I assembled this from a variety of sources, the pros and cons, human intelligence versus artificial intelligence. And uh, I'm happy, I'd be happy to discuss and disagree with you on some of these. Of course, human intelligence, it's great. We all use it, we have it. It, it is one of the, the, the trademarks of humans in, in the, the larger context of, of the world we are living in, right? We have intuition, we are creative, we have sense of humor. Uh, machines cannot do that. They can tell jokes. I don't think uh, a software can create a good joke. Or a software can display personality yet. Not at all. On the other hand, if you think about the machines are available 24 hours. We need to sleep a number of hours, right? They're more reliable in a sense. We are humans. How many times you said, I'm human, I make mistakes. I, they tend not to make that many mistakes. No, the, the drawback is that they do not display creativity necessarily. As I said, many such devices have access to information. In New York, there was a contest for the best, the most knowledgeable lawyer, the best lawyer. Uh, they uh, gave a test to, I don't know, a dozen humans and a software and uh, retrieving precedents, uh, retrieving uh, law, text of law that will support seven, uh, several arguments. The software went by far. In a few minutes, was able to provide all the answers, while humans took two hours and even missed some. Does that software, does that make the software the best lawyer in New York? Not at all. Again, it's the most knowledgeable one. To win a case in a court of law is more than what you know. It's what impression you make on the jury, it's how you present the case, it's very subtle in the, the interactions you have with other humans. And then there are famous supporter and um, people who oppose uh, artificial intelligence. Elon Musk said that we have a very small chance to make it safe, that it's going to destroy us. Stephen Hawking, who recently passed, um, uh, uh, thought that is the worst event in history. But hopefully we will get some progress from Google and Microsoft where the CEOs still think that this is a good idea. And I'm sure you have your own opinion about this whole thing. And I'm going to invite you to continue the discussion somehow and, and, and put on what I thought were three statements that can uh, incite further, further conversations and maybe even some collaborations. One that machines do, will not displace <coughs> us from research, on the contrary. They augment our brain, they could be our partner. I look forward for the day when we will acknowledge, acknowledge in our scientific papers contributions from some software. We we'll say, here are the co-authors, and we also want to acknowledge, I don't know, Phoenix, our code, who was able to identify, I don't know what chemical compound as being the most successful. I think humans and machines, if they partner, create an entity that is more intelligent, could be more creative, more knowledgeable, definitely, than humans alone. And uh, I do believe that all of this will change our society for the better if we are wise enough to navigate through the perils, ethical, technological, communication dangers of using machines excessively, sometimes without the necessary precautions and without the, 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 the environment that will make the use uh, safe and secure. But I'm optimistic. I think many of you students will use intelligent software in your 
future work, be it research or something else. And also at home, who knows? It will make our life better, I believe. So thank you for your attention. Any questions from the audience? This is a good time to philosophize. <laughs> yes. Um, it's, it struck me, you, you read a lot about um, the power of computing, and yet the energy consumption of computers is tremendous. I don't know what the statistics are for uh, these huge data centers using tremendous amounts of power. So compared to the human brain, computers are very fast, but they're extremely energy inefficient. And uh, animals' brains, human brains, are very energy efficient. I wonder if you maybe you could talk a little bit about the efforts that people are making to try to slow computers down <coughs> but to make them much more energy efficient so they're much more of a sustainable computer. Is that something that, that Argonne is interested in or that you, you guys are thinking Yes. About? So uh, in, in case you didn't hear the question or for other, other purpose, I'm going to repeat it. So the, uh, in essence, the question was, um, uh, can, are we doing are we conducting any research to decrease the energy consumption of, cons of computers? Because at uh, this moment, uh, uh, that energy consumption is orders of magnitude, magnitude larger than the human brain for similar tasks, I would say. So two things. Yes, at Argonne, there is research uh, having to do with uh, either neuromorphic uh, uh, processing units that will try to replicate the way the brain is organized. And I've heard that there is work being done on that, uh, talking with Professor Toroskai, that uh, in examining this possibility that we can improve the way the hardware of the computer is created such that it uses less energy. And maybe we find inspiration from the way the brain, the human brain is. I'm not involved in that research, I'm just saying it's an active uh, area and at uh, Argonne it's, uh, elements of, of such a program are being very well supported. I also believe that there is a chance that we will achieve different type of computing. Either going through digital computing, which is analog computing, which is again another topic of, of a discussion with Professor Toroskai that I have today, or all the way to quantum computing that may have lower energy requirements and in fact will process information and will do uh, will compute in a different way quantum computers can collapse to the solution immediately there is also there are also various aspects that may jeopardize the possibility of actually creating a quantum computer entang entanglement and uh, but there is prob there are problems with any technology there are efforts, yes, to reduce the, consumption, the energy consumptions for a number of uh, reasons. Uh, I don't know, I cannot uh, make a prediction of how soon we will have anything, any computational entity that is not human that even approaches the level of energy efficiency that we have. So, right, that will remain uh, a problem, I would say. Yes. So I wanted to ask how concerned you are for the future of AI. And the context of this is, me and my friend often talk about, since we use computers more and more and learn more about like programming aspects of artificial intelligence, we've become very much less scared um, about the future of AI. Um, whereas in the kind of the public consciousness, there's things like the Matrix and Skynet, which I think people have kind of a little bit of a fear of where AI is headed. Where do you find yourself on that? Are you concerned long term about the kind of how Elon Musk was talking about five to ten percent of this going that wrong? Right. So, try to summarize the question. It starts with uh, uh, an observation that uh, uh, people who engage in AI research find it less scary than the public at large, who seems to be really frightened. And this, the, then the question was, where do I sit in this spectrum? So, I would say that both. Uh, as I was trying to, to illustrate, there are different opinions about the role of AI and the future uh, the, in the impact of artificial intelligence on, on the society. And somehow, everybody 
has, uh, make, can make a good point from a specific point of view, I would say. Can argue that it can be dangerous or can argue that it could be useful. To be clear, I, I am on the camp that believes artificial intelligence will be of tremendous positive impact on our society. So what does the uncertainty come from to punt intended with respect to, to this question? Mostly from not understanding in detail how artificial intelligence works. That's part of it. You, as, as uh, uh, the colleague who asked the question confessed, once he engaged in some work, uh, some of the, uh, the, the fear diminished. Maybe not disappeared, but diminished. Why I'm so optimistic is that it is not the first time when human society goes to a transformation like this. And there have been in the past. There was the agricultural revolution. Nobody can remember those times, millions of years ago, when I'm sure some humans were concerned that once we do this, the community or the, the people will be in great danger. Think of the Industrial Revolution. We have more information about that, right? People who would manufacture things at home would say, oh, these are going to destroy us, there will be no jobs, uh, the, uh, the factories will replace all humans, we will all disappear, we will be out without a purpose in life. And, we're going through a revolution now, right? We, computers, software uh, are going to impact the society. More in areas where we do repetitive work, right? There will be a, a, a shift in the percentage of jobs occupied by humans, I believe, in areas that require repetitive actions. Maybe even uh, more in some uh, areas that require creativity. So some jobs will have to morph into something different. But I am optimistic and positive because I believe in the robustness and the resilience of the human species, of the human society. I think we are going to be just fine to, to answer your question clearly. Yes. So a lot of the machine learning approaches that have been responsible for the surge in its popularity over you know, the recent past came from domain applications where people are trying to model, model some process that they don't understand uh, from a first principles perspective, like human behavior or what's this image, how do I classify this? So, when, as engineers, we take these models and we apply them to a physical system, we might have more information about um, what sort of results we might expect. For example, in the specific heat uh, example that you put up, maybe I don't want to predict that there's a possibility that it's going to have a negative specific heat, but that was in the prior. But incorporating that, in, that information takes a lot of effort in order to pose a model that you can actually use. So my question for you, for you is, what is the value in your opinion of inputting that effort from engineers to uh, pose physical constraints, say within your prior or otherwise in these models? Because obviously they can help, but they also affect the generality of these models. So what, what do you see as far as the value of that trade-off in practice? <laughs> okay, so thank you. Uh, again, uh, there was a comment in the beginning that uh, uh, a lot of impact, positive impact of machine learning was uh, initially observed in social sciences where governing laws are not as clear as uh, in physical sciences, right? We have our equations that describe evolution of either stochastic or deterministic. The, but then the question was uh, how machine learning can truly benefit an area where in fact we could do first principle calculations if we wanted and if we had enough resources and more specifically if imposing constraints on the priors, on the prior probabilities will improve or impede upon the predictions in, in Bayesian analysis. Um, I do agree with the comment and I think it was a justified uh, comment that uh, indeed machine learning helped a lot together with agent-based models, for example, in predicting evolution of social systems where governing uh, laws, like partial differential equations uh, do not help. With the second one, 
I believe that the, the, the benefit of using machine learning, deep learning algorithms comes from the power that we can get in looking at either high volumes of data or even more at high data streams, rates of generating data. I think we will be able shortly to make predictions and do optimizations, including Bayesian analysis, on data sets that are being generated at extraordinary rates. And that would be an analysis that is not post-mortem, as you say. So I get my million data points, and I'm going to take three weeks to look at that and try to model it. It's going to be near real-time, and in some cases, real-time analysis. And that will impact the way we conduct research in a practical way. Think you are at the advanced photon source at Argonne National Lab, and you get from that huge X-ray machine information that comes at millions of data points, terabytes per second. I believe you will be able soon to have a software that processes that in near real time and provide guidance as you do the experiment. So these people spend six, eight, 12 hours overnight running these simulations. Currently, they run a simulation uh, 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 characterization, collect information, go back to the, to the university, look at that and say, oh, this is bad. We should have had, I don't know what parameter, up or down. Oh, ah, what a good idea if we had a chance to modify it. I believe in a few years we will have software that will provide that information and assist in that decision in real time, near real time. You conduct your experiment and the software may say, you know what, it's not going the right way, you better adjust this parameter. And that's general for any experiment that involves tremendous amount of data. So to me, this is the, the highest benefit. Is machine learning or even deep learning equivalent to the physics-based simulations that we do today, it is not. And I'm afraid that we lose as we do machine learning and deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, we lose the, f the insights, the physical representation of the data we have. A machine learning algorithm for my heat specific heat experiment is not going to give me necessarily a a mathematical expression of the property versus temperature, and I cannot look into that and say, oh, this is a divide temperature, and I know what that means, because it has to do with the frequency. It's going to speed out a set of data points or a graph that shows a correlation, losing along the way the physics that we currently put in some of these representations. So that is the danger. So I try to illustrate the positive aspect, which I think is in processing volume, you know, there are three Vs in the uh, uh, big data analysis. Some of you who, who, who work in that, we know, is volume, volume uh, velocity, and variance. Analyzing data may, is not necessarily numbers. It could be figures, and there's another talk about that, how to use machine learning to classify microstructures, for example, or to identify the group features and so forth. So there are good things about this and uh, there are some dangers too. Other side. Yes. I know machines rely on a large amount of data, but how much is enough? Because right now, I know like in some cases, computer power can be the limitation. Like, oh, that could be the best you can get amount of data-wise. So what do you think, like, how much data is enough to assess a model? All right, so the comment is, uh, the, the question was, uh, how much data is sufficient, is enough to create a good model? Very interesting uh, question, I have to say. And it's tempting for any researcher, with or without the use of machine learning or artificial intelligence, to say the more data you have, the better. So let's use all, let's, let's analyze everything, let's, but can be too much data uh, uh, really damaging your modeling process. And it can be. Let me just preface the, the answer with a, a, a brief description of two important aspects of machine learning. You use a training set. So you say you have a million data points. And you use 750 data points to train the algorithm, to train the algorithm in creating a model. 
And then the rest, 25%, as a test set. You make predictions and see if uh, the model you propose represents the data. And often we do cross-validation, like we shuffle data around and use a different 75% to train the algorithm and a different 25% to make the predictions. And as new data comes in, some uh, is used to retrain the algorithm and some is used to predict. The, to go to your question, the danger of using too much data to train the algorithm resides in overfitting. You create a model that is so good at representing the information you have that it practically is of no use. So if I use 98% of my data to perfect a model, then I cannot predict anything with that because it's going to be uh, too good to be useful. The danger of not using sufficient information to train the machine learning algorithms consists in lack of predictability. You cannot then uh, examine any scenario or make any prediction about the rest. So it is a tricky question uh, how much data you need to use to create a good model, an optimal model. And the answer is, no, is not the more data the better, is I think also resides in the human decision of what this percentage needs to be. That's why I'm advocating for a human-machine partnership and not letting the machine to run the, the, the research, the study by itself. So I think it's a, an expert decision. An expert in the field may decide for this particular problem we need to train on 60%. On for this particular problem we need to use a, a larger fraction of data. So it is not a universal answer, and I don't believe in the more data you use to train an algorithm, the better the, the model will be. It could become almost perfect and useless, as I said. Yes? Um, I actually work in machine learning, uh, particularly deep learning, um, and I'd like to, if you mind, can I add something to what you just said? Yes. Um, a data set is a discrete representation of the reality of the world. So increasing the discrete representation is not going to um, uh, infinitely, is not going to give you every representation possible. So when you train a machine learning algorithm on that data, um, the reason you get overfitting is because you have not accounted for all possibilities. Um, and, and that's why the answer of you could say infinite data is best means that you can never actually get there even if you have computing power because it's a discrete representation of the real time. Right. So I agree with the comment. I, I also go back to my previous answer to, to amend the comment. So the comment was very, very good that uh, uh, the, the training is uh, most, uh, is, is optimal when you use as many representations of reality as you can. Uh, in practice, this is impossible. But should you be able to account for all the representations, then your model will become optimal. I go back to my previous statement that if you do that, if you know everything about the system and you train your algorithm using all that information, the result becomes of little use. The result would be, here's a representation of all the data I have. It's perfect. I cannot predict much about it because there is everything I knew what is already included in the model. So if, uh, not to mention that occasionally people will do something very weird, which I find in publications even nowadays, which is they use the same data set to train the, the machine learning algorithm and then the same data set to test it, which is uh, it's a guaranteed 100% success. <laughs> But what? What's a, but a, but a good comment. I, I thank you. Uh, that that was a good point. I think this would be a good time to finish. It's one thirty-two. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you to the next seminar in the fall.